go. Unless someone else has a guess. Let's hear your, you go ahead. Go, break the ice for us. I'm going to go for 10,000 miles. Okay, 10,000, so like a little less than a guess. third. All right, what else? Let's hear another guess. 35. 35, 35,000. 35, so you think most are able to support salmon? Excellent. Oh, time up. That are catalog? That are catalog, sorry, yes, that are catalog. So 35, yeah, sorry. As in, like, documented by all the experts and saying that have these catalog. lines that look like right. this in this catalog, how many right. of them are documented? So right. 35,000, 10,000. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to go with like a thousand. A thousand? All right. Well, if this were the price that was right, then Meadow would win because you both were grossly over the number of miles that are that were cataloged in 2012. Go ahead, and I think the next slide has the answer. Um, about 2,168 miles. And so there's a couple things that this says to me. Um, and if we go to the next slide, it says it right on the front page of um, or right on the website that the state has is that. Underlined, based upon thorough surveys of a few drainages, it is believed that this number represents less than 50% of the streams. So they're, they're estimating that 50% of anadromous or um, salmon-bearing streams are not listed in the catalog. Can you go back again, because this wording is too overwhelming to look at. Um, and so maybe 2,000, so 2,000 are already cataloged, maybe there's up to 4,000, which is still less than what you were saying. So the other thing that this number tells me is that even though we're surrounded by water, especially here in Cordoba, there's definitely certain characteristics of that habitat that make it better or worse um, for fish to be able to um, spawn or rear in those areas. Um, so that, so because they're, um, even though we're surrounded by water, it takes certain characteristics to support salmon. That's one reason that we wanted to develop this project because we wanted to make sure that those waters that are able to support salmon are protected in this catalog or listed in this catalog and then receive protection um, under state law um, by, if, I don't know, they can't recite the exact statute, but anything that's listed in the catalog will receive special protection. Uh, it doesn't mean that development can't happen, but it does mean that if there were to be a roadway developed, um, proposed, or um, resource extraction proposed, that there would have to be certain protections put in place um, for streams that are listed in the catalog um, so that we can protect our, our salmon streams. You can go ahead and jump forward to Meadow. Another? Oh, you go to Meadow, yeah. Um, so what we, we started um, a few, 2012 is when all of our planning started. Um, and I think Meadow's going to pass around a clipboard, so if you haven't signed in yet, you could go ahead and sign in, would be great. Um, and this isn't a great picture, but I, it, it shows enough of what I want to, the point I want to make here. Um, so when we started our planning process, we wanted to start figuring out, well, where should we be doing surveys? Where are we missing information? And so this um, didn't come through too well in PowerPoint, but this, these are streams. All these colorful worms are streams, and these blue areas are lakes. Um, and this is the Copper River itself. This is an, this is an area upriver. Um, the Glen Highway, with, like Glen Allen is like right here, essentially, um, in that area, if you're familiar with the Copper Basin. And so there's a model for, um, king salmon habitat that's been developed. And so what researchers did was, instead of, because it's so hard to get to all of these streams on the ground, they were trying to um, focus survey efforts in areas that have the potential to support king salmon. So they were able to narrow down three things that were the, had the biggest influence on whether or not there would be king salmon. And those three things were um, glacial influence in the system, the gradient of the, the stream, so how steep um, of a, a gradient it had flowing downhill. So if it's a steeper gradient, it's going to flow faster. If it's a lower gradient, then it's not as steep, so it's going to flow uh, slower. And then they also looked at um, the mean annual flow. And so they called this intrinsic potential. And looking at those three things, which was data that they have, were able to collect without having to be on the ground, looking at each of these streams, they could predict where there would be a high potential for king salmon. And so um, these streams that are in red have a high potential, um, but aren't currently listed in the catalog. You can't really tell, but this stream here has some blue with it, and this has blue, and those are already cataloged streams. But anything that was showing up with red and pink, um, were, or red and yellow, were some of our higher probability streams. And so that was one way that we determined where we would do surveys 
And the other way was just using local knowledge. Um, there's a lot of institutional memory from um, people who work uh, for the Forest Service or for Fish and Game or for pilots who fly over the region and can see fish from the air um, about where fish are. And so we um, also generated a list of survey sites based on that kind of input. And I started talking with Mike, but if there's other folks who are interested and have familiarity with these stream systems and want to check out the catalog to see if you notice any that might be missing, I'd be happy to set you up with that so you can explore. So let's move on from this fuzzy picture that hurts the eyes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so just a little cap of what we have accomplished since we started. Our first field season was 2013. And we started here in Cordova. We piloted the program with a group of high school students and during our Copper River Stewardship Program in the summertime just to see how the protocols worked. And in 2013, we did our first training of adults in this kind of setting. Um, and then last year, we repeated it. And we also were able to do some more surveys in the upper basin and the upper part of the watershed. So we've had a total of 237 people out on surveys. For a region that has 6,000 people living here, that's pretty high percentage and very exciting. Some of them are people like Andrea who come out like every year. So granted, <laughs> she probably got counted twice in that, but it's still a significant number of people for the small population that we have. 175 of those are students. And so appreciate folks like Mr. Westing here in Cordova. And um, there's teachers up in the Copper River School District who have been really great advocates for getting students out, and um, this will be the third year that we have a whole day where Cordo High School students are leaving school to go to um, do salmon blitz all day, so take their learning to the outside. Um, we've worked with 15 experts from seven regional partners, so I um, just got to give a shout out to folks like um, our research biologist at Fish and Game here at the Forest Service. Um, we've got Kirsty Jerica, our science coordinator on the project, who's helped develop um, our protocols and manages all of our data and has also, you know, for everything from making bait bags to cleaning waders to um, guiding trips and, and outings for participants. Um, and then folks from the Bureau of Land Management, the National Park Service up in the Copper Basin, um, folks from the Science Center here in town, and then another nonprofit, the Rice Institute for Science and Environment upriver. So, Definitely not anything that we could do alone as an organization, so I just want to make sure to give credit where credit is due. Um, so the next slide shows, um, this is our new online mapper that's happening, that we've done a total of uh, 35 surveys, and this is just the Cordova area, and all of those dots are surveys that have happened in the Copper River Delta. Um, so, except for, no, oh, that one did happen. There's another one up by Child. Oh, I can see this one with it. It's a um, So yeah, so there's 20 spots on there that we've been able to survey. Um, oh, I forgot to mention Native Village of Yak because um, they've been especially critical for getting to sites like this where we jet boat up the Copper River and on uh, Yak Lake. Um, we got to boat over to, to do that survey. So just to give you an idea, we've been busy around these parts. Go ahead, Meadow. Um, this Napper will soon be available on our website, and um, once it is, any data that you help collect this fall, and I'm actually going to see if, if you all will help upload some of this data. Um, but then you can also go and you can check out the other streams, learn a little bit about what happened in these other areas, and see pictures of the fish and what the streams look like. Um, so this is exciting and in process. I have to put that up there because we're working hard on it. <laughs> Um, so I want you to look at all of these and tell me which systems you think coho salmon live in. I mean, these are all, we've got a glacial system, we've got a major flooded Hartney Creek up there, um, pretty small trickle out by the Alleghenic um, Fisherman's Trail. Anyone want to take a guess at which ones have coho salmon that live in them? Oh, I'm going to say all of them. Oh, you caught me, Bob. You're right. Yeah. So I think that's one of the cool things about this project is that all of these systems look so different, yet they're still supporting fish. And this program is allowing us, as well as anyone who participates, to be able to start to look at these differences and compare these systems and learn a little bit more about the details that are important for supporting the, the fish that it, it does support. Um, all right, go to the next. So this is some of the data totals. So when we look at the data, um, so the main thing that we need to, to get um, habitat nominated into the Natamus Waters Catalog 
is a positive identification on the fish and the latitude and longitude um, where it is. And so we have collected a lot of other data that I'll talk about, um, but just to make sure that that stays as the focus. Um, so with that, we can create nominations that are submitted to the state of Alaska. And this line here is showing um, that these are all new streams that weren't cataloged at all. Um, so I actually I don't have the number of how many streams it was, but it was a total of 12 and a little over 12 and a quarter miles of new streams added. Um, for this line, the two and a quarter miles is increased upstream extent for listed species. So that meant that the catalog had a line on the stream already, but the line wasn't as far up as fish were actually using. So we were able to go further and add more length onto that line on the map. Um, this almost eight miles was for, cat for streams that were already listed, but we identified a new species that wasn't cataloged as living there. So adding maybe coho were list or maybe sockeye were listed, but coho weren't. Um, so we were able to do that. And then um, just over 12 miles was added life stage designation. And what that means is when the state lists their lists their um, habitats in the catalog. Sometimes it'll say whether it's spawning or rearing, with a little s and a little r. Um, but sometimes it just says p for present, that salmon were present. And um, for the state's purpose of the catalog, that's all they really need to know. But for other people who are turning to this catalog for either baseline data or just understanding fish distribution, it's helpful to know if it's spawning or rearing. Because there's also characteristics of habitat that are different that fish need for spawning versus what they might use for rearing. Like they can rear in places that they can't spawn. So um, we wanted to add a little bit more detail, so we did that for just over 12 miles. Um, so that's where we get our almost 35 miles of new habitat data. So it's exciting that um, not only is it a fun experience out in the field, but it also is um, a way to contribute to help make the tool that's being used to manage our fish, local fish habitat, make that tool more effective by making sure more of the data is listed. Um, so, oh, Andrea, there you are. <laughs> um, so we have some target sites that are on our list for this fall. Um, the high school students are going to be helping out with Power Creek and Hatchery Creek. Those are two streams out on um, Power Creek Road, um, draining into Eak Lake. Um, if anybody is interested in, ha is a, a motorized recreator in the Delta, we don't have ATVs as an organization, but um, Sherman, it's, I'm calling it Sherman Tributary, it's by Sherman Glacier. Um, it's up Boulder Alley. It's, I mean, you can walk it as well, but it would be really fast and efficient to get there. There's straight access with motorized um, recreation vehicles um, and would be a cool place to camp out even because it's really beautiful back there. Um, there's a Sheridan River tributary that we need to figure out a little bit more. We're going to get the high school students that are going to help us with that. Um, there's Goose Meadows. There's some un unnamed upland channels that in that drainage area of, of between Haystack and McKinley Lake, there's a big muskeg area about, I don't know, 19, 20 miles or so. Um, so that's where those tributaries are. Those are going to be some off-road hiking adventures, walking across the wetland and into some really beautiful woods. Actually, it's back to where that picture of Andre in the bottom where she's standing is one of those, near one of those streams. Um, pipeline Lake 3 outlet, so if you know the Pipeline Lake series, there's um, number three has a outlet that goes into what is called Black Hole out in the Delta, which is um, like 20, 20 mile there. So we're looking for some help on that stream. Wooded and Wrongway ponds are um, in the Saddle Bag, between Saddle Bag and McKinley drainages. And then Saddle Bag um, River and Lake area, there's some, um, the Forest Service is actually already interested in this area because of some wood cutting units that they're trying to expand. And so they're trying to get some, all the habitat documented there to make sure that the wood cutting um, doesn't interfere with any of the fish habitat. And then there's a, a stream right by Allegheny Road that um, has, it ha is listed for spawning but not for rearing that we're curious about. So these are some of the areas that we're looking for volunteers to help with. And then we also, if you can go to the next slide, I know, have um, some spawning sites. So these top three, Nicolette, Heaney, and Newbridge, these are all out Whiteshed Road. 
Nicolette is Three Mile Bay. That's the um, where that huge, huge, longest culvert went in the summer when they did the road construction on Whiteshed Road. Um, Heaney Creek is just at um, maybe mile two um, on Whiteshed Road. And then New Bridge Creek is it's past Hartney Bay. It's where the where the new bridge that made a village of Yak put in. Um, it's called, we just call it New Bridge Creek. It's Jim not Paul really Creek. its name. Is it? That's a lot of people call it. Okay. If it doesn't have a name already, that'd be a pretty nice name. Okay. Um, and so these are, those three are streams that we found coho rearing in, but don't, we, we're not sure that there's actually spawning populations there. And it's known that, that it's just starting to be documented that these, um, they're called like nomadic, is that the term they're using? Nomadic um, coho, that they're leaving their natal stream and going into the, the salt water and then going down the coast and going back into a freshwater stream to rear elsewhere, which is kind of unique when we think that fish, you know, grow up till they're ready to go out to the ocean in fresh water, then go out to the ocean and grow up to be adults and then come back to the natal stream, but they're actually changing out streams. And we're curious if that's happening around Cordoba and so we wanted some help doing some focused uh, adult surveys on these drainages just so we can make sure that we're not missing a spawning population there. So the spawning would be new data for these, these systems, but if there isn't spawning documented, then it might help us identify that there's some nomadic cohos living around Cordova. And the Forest Service actually is already doing genetic sampling on the Copper River Delta, so if we find that there aren't spawning populations in these creeks, we might actually collect some fin clips from fish so that they can genetically sample to see if they can identify where these nomads are coming from. So that'll be cool science either way, but um, if, you're help, if you're interested in helping out with spawning surveys, that would involve going out um, maybe every other week or it would just kind of somewhat regularly between now and the end of October, things start to freeze up just to walk to see when salmon, if, if adult salmon are coming in. So just be going for a creek walk um, pretty pretty regularly over the next um, couple months or month and a half. Okay. Do, um, do you know, like, do they go back to where they, the streams they hatched? Or if they are using these other streams, do they know the difference between the one they hatched in and the one they reared in? Through genetics they can tell, but no. But they're they, being, it's, the biggest thing on this is that, I mean, for a while we all believed that they wouldn't be able to, um, that, you know, have to be tolerant to the salinity. You know, that was always like, oh, they can't go out into any kind of ocean. Where now it's like we're finding these um, juveniles that have had some, so you know. Up, they go up another stream. The they go, up, they, they go out into the ocean. I mean, we know that they've left certain streams and within watersheds and without going to the ocean. Now we've you know, determine that they are actually going into the ocean and going up other streams, mm -hmm. that they actually have that so when tolerance. They back, when they come back to spawn, do they go to the ones they reared in or the ones they hatched in? Who knows? No. Yeah, it's a mixed bag. <laughs> <laughs> it's University of Washington research that has been published that I could look into that a little bit more because I am curious, but I don't know the answer for that either. Or if they even know the answer. Um, okay. And so this is like kind of the conclusion of the informational part before we get into the like training of what it means to be out in the field. So I just wanted to take a little time out to make sure I list all the um, partners and funders who have helped make Salmon Blitz happen. Um, some of them I've already mentioned. Um, <coughs> so move on. So you'll want to go on a survey. Um, this is how it works. Um, so it's a, typically a two-day process. Um, we've applied for a permit from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game. Um, and I'm not going to do a ton of show and tell, so I think we're okay with the light out for now. Um, to use minnow traps, our main tool out in the field, um, to be able to, to set them. So this just a little caveat that don't go willy-nilly on us and start sampling and say you're salmon blitzing because we have to do it under our permit and we have some requirements like informing the, the biologist before we go out in the field where we're going to be surveying and whatnot. Um, so we do, these are minnow traps that we use. Um, they're two halves make a hole um, and we'll have time at the end to play with how we set our minnow traps. 
Um, but you, we have all the bait that you need. Um, we, we treat salmon roe, so we're using salmon eggs, and we put that in um, a little plastic bag, and you put holes in the bag and set it in the minnow trap. Um, if it's going to be, a, if there's a big downpour on the horizon, then we're going to ask you not to, to go out and do your sample because any time that the water is going to come up quickly is going to be damaging to the fish. I don't know if you remember when we went out to Middle Arm. <laughs> we, had, we had to go out because we had, we had set the traps and we were committed. But it was not only a little hard on the fish, but it was a little hard on some of us <laughs> that were out there, especially some of the lighter ones who almost washed away. Um, because they can get pinned against the side if the current's picked up, they'll get pinned against the side of the trap and um, they can't. Um, we, do, we do put rocks if it's like fast moving water or if there's potential for some rain, we don't think it's going to be a bad one, we just want to be sure because then that gives a barrier so the fish can have a break behind the rock so it's not stuck in the current. But if a fish was just in a trap in a wide open current, it would have to be swimming the whole time to not be pinned up against the side of the trap. Um, so if you're hiking in a stream and there's a barrier, like there's a huge waterfall or there's um, a big tree that's fallen and it's like a two to three foot difference and you might not think fish can get above it, below it, one way to test it is to set traps above and below it. So it's okay to set them that way um, and or to set some close together. But we also are trying to get distance and so you want to, um, you know, Make sure you're walking up the stream a ways. You don't want all your traps set right next to each other, or you're not going to get very much data on the length of the stream. You're just going to get a lot of data on a, on a small concentration of the stream. Um, and when we set our traps, we think like a fish. Um, so this is a basic schematic of a stream. Um, so in the outside of the curves is where we tend to have deeper, slower moving water. And so we'll call those pools. Um, there's lots of they don't necessarily have to be on a curve, but anywhere that you see an area that's deeper than average in the stream, um, it tends to be where water's moving a little bit slower and a good place to, to look to set minnow traps, especially if we did on the Kinley Trail, that was a ton of pools that were great, great trapping there. Um, the riffles are, that's what this word down at the bottom is saying, and so um, riffles is anywhere that there's rocks breaking the surface, it's turbulent water, and it's really important for the stream because that's one of the ways that oxygen gets into the water, which is important for fish. So um, we don't necessarily set traps and riffles if, if you have other options, but um, you know there might be a big boulder in that riffle that has a slow pool behind it that might not be a bad place. So just keep thinking like a fish when you're out there. And then um, a run are kind of what connects these different complexities. So a run is just your average stream. Um, there's no deep pools. There's no shallow riffles. Um, and those can be good places to set traps, especially because runs often get undercut banks, which we'll talk about a little bit here. Um, so we use GPS units to record where our traps are. Um, and so we will, can teach you how to use these if you haven't used them before. Um, and then it helps you when you go back the next day to find where your traps are. And then um, if you're, we, whether or not you catch fish, we need to report, we use the GPS data um, to report what we found and not finding something is still data. So we still report where we set traps and didn't catch anything. Um, so let's go on because I think these next pictures are going to test us a little bit on our riffle runner pool. So um, anyone want to take a guess at what we might call that up there? Where the rocks, where the rocks are? What, what would that be called? A riffle, yeah. So that is a riffle. And it's hard to tell depth here. Um, so let's go to the next one, because I think that will tell us. Yes. So um, when this is not the average depth of our stream, so what do you think they're standing for? A pool. A pool. Yeah. Nice, large, woody debris hanging over, so good, shadowy, sheltered spots for fish to be and for Girl Scouts to be, apparently. Um, next. What about this stretch here? <laughs> it's not a waterfall. Yeah, this is more of a run. And you can see that in general, like I'm standing in the shallow and there's somebody who's a little deeper, but both those ladies on either side of the creek are relatively the same depth, and that was the average depth of this creek up in the, in the basin. So, yeah, so that's a run. All right, so you passed that test so far. All right, what's next? Um, so these are some examples of good places to set minnow traps. So underneath root wads in a stream. 
Um, this is a picture. The main stream is running here. And so we would call this a little side channel. So it's very much attached to the main creek, um, but it's out of the main current. And there were some really big um, root wads there. So we had a really successful set on that trap. Um, the upper one, the trap is behind that log there. So there's actually like a, a hole in the, I guess it's like the root structure. Um, so we just drop the trap down in there because fish are seeking shelter there. So we want to put the yummy buffet minnow trap right where they're seeking shelter so that they'll, they'll seek shelter in our traps and we can see them. Um, and this lower picture here shows um, an undercut bank so you can see how that trap is um, not out in the middle of the stream but under that little shelf created by the edge of the stream there. Go ahead to the next. Um, so once you've set your traps, um, I typically recommend if you're doing the two-day outing that you also do your habitat data, um, but I don't like to overwhelm our volunteers right away because really all we need for our nominations for the state are positive identification of the fish and the GPS units. All the other data that we're collecting is merely to help educate us as participants about these stream features as well as to just document some baseline data because um, then from the, um, from the research side, we can be looking at these different stream types that are supporting salmon. Um, so we're going we're to come back to the habitat and just focus on the fish to begin with. Um, so main things to know about um, fish. Well, I want you to tell me, what are some things that you think that you would want to look at to help identify the fish species that you're looking at? What do you think are some areas that would be some key features? The par marks. What are the par marks? Are those the par marks? Yes. <laughs> and what about those par marks might help you tell something about the fish? Yeah, different patterns. Um, some of them, it's important to, to recognize that fish have this lateral line that runs the length of their body because the lateral line, um, some, some par marks are only above the lateral line while other fish, like this cartoon here, has there are par marks that cross over the lateral line. What else besides the par marks might be help you identify the species? Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> I would look at different fins of the fish, maybe. Yes. So you will look at different fins. We'll talk about some particulars, but some fish have different shaped fins, like Arctic grayling have really unique um, dorsal fins. Um, some fish, like coho, have stripes on the leading edge of the dorsal and the anal fin. Um, sometimes fins are different colors. Some of them have different numbers of fin rays, but we don't count fin rays. We can kill the fish for that. So, um, so yeah, so the, the fins can be indicative. And not just like the, face, the shape of the fins, but the shape of the tails, tail fins. So here you can see this is a vervet with a rounded tail, whereas a salmonid or a trout would have a forked tail. Um, and then the shape of their heads, too, can be indicative, because it'll tell you also, not only will it help you tell what they are, but it can help you tell what they eat. Um, so go ahead. So when you check the traps, um, this is a, little, a good example of how you want to check your traps, because fish need to be in the water to breathe. So we, we like to turn our traps, they'll set in the stream like this and turn them this way so that you can always keep part of the trap in the water. And so you can see that she's got the bottom part of the trap here um, and she eventually will hand this off to that hand and somebody has a bucket of water ready to receive the fish in the trap. So we're minimizing how much our fish are out of the water because they don't do well out of the water. Okay, go ahead. And then we, um, Identify. So we use these Ziploc bags, very expensive pieces of equipment, but they're very useful for identifying, um, for handling fish and letting them stay in the water. Um, so, and then the key here is everybody is working over a bucket and close to the surface of the bucket because fish aren't going to just lay there and let you do whatever you want. They're going to want to get away and flop around. And so we always make sure that we're doing it over top of the bucket so that the fish flop right back into the water. Um, and we measure one out of every five, and we measure them in millimeters. And so we'll practice that in the next few slides. Um, but we, if you catch, say, only two coho, and one of them is really small and one of them is really big, it would also be good to measure those because the length of the fish can help indicate how old they are. And coho, for example, can stay in freshwater for two, three, four years. And so by telling 
their length, we can see if it, are they all from the same age class or are there multiple generations of coho living in this stream. So that's why we measure them um, and also why you would measure more than one out of every five if you have big size discrepancies. Go ahead, no. Um, so this is what the measuring board looks like. It's not quite perfect because ideally you want the nose to be straight along here. Um, but we trick you because we have both inches and centimeters. And I said we measure the length of fish in what unit? Millimeters. Millimeters, that's right. So um, that means we're using our centimeter side and it looks, and we're measuring on fin, fins that fork. We measure to the bottom of the fork. So does anyone want to take a guess at how long you think that fish is, the way it's laying here on the board right now? 69 millimeters. There you go, 69 millimeters. I love it. Excellent. What's next? So, okay. <laughs> So what about this one? So this is eight, nine, ten. And six. Ninety-four to ninety-six, that's good. Yeah, and it's okay if you're off by like four or five. I mean, it's a range of ten is how like the, the data is analyzed. So between thirty and forty millimeters are all grouped together. Because sometimes a fish is flopping and you only get like I swear this tail was right about here and you'll never have it lay flat, so it's okay to take your best guess where it flops. Next one. How long is this thing? Totally higher. Yes, excellent. Is everybody else catching it? This side of the class I know has it. Is everyone over here? Catherine, <laughs> you agree? Excellent. All right, next. Um, so what's also really good is to take pictures of fish. So obviously taking pictures in the measuring board is good. It is the clearest. Um, it can be a little traumatic for the fish if you, you know, if you're taking a while to measure them. So you can also use your Ziploc bag to take pictures. Go ahead. Um, these are other ways people took pictures, putting the bucket behind it, putting the measuring board behind it. Go ahead. And then again, just putting them in the measuring board. So these are done being measured. They're not, you know, lined correctly, but it was an opportunity for the photographer to snap some pictures. Do they really? Um, sorry, do they lay flat so well? Because when we were doing it at the school, they never laid flat. No, I mean, for every one picture like this, there's probably like ten other pictures of fish flopping or on their upright. So it, it takes a while. I mean, it might take a while, but. I always like to put a little bit of water in the measuring board Yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah, yeah so they're kind of calm them actually. So the water and the other thing too that sometimes helps is you don't want to you don't want to press their head, but when you cover a fish's head, like it kind of like it seems to me that it can also calm them down a little bit. Okay, so a little bit of fish identification practice. Does anybody know what this one is before I tell you? So this is one that's very abundant on the Copper River Delta, and this is not a picture from us, but I like to include it because it makes this feature very obvious. So we've got par marks that are above and below the lateral line, um, and then white and black leading edges, and I don't want to take a guess. Andre? Is it cutthroat or coho? Coho, yes. You'll recognize the cutthroat when you see it. So go ahead to the next slide. So these are our cohos, and this is this is taken from the field guide that you have in the field. So these are kind of the clues that you would have to remind you. You're not just because it doesn't have this doesn't mean that it's not a coho. And you rarely really actually see those nice leading edges. Yeah, that's so. that's like super exaggerated. I mean, you well, we have I have like a hundred pictures that you can practice with afterwards, to, and they're not all of coho, but it'll let you see the range of coho. So. But the main thing, especially compared to species around here that you might catch is that their par marks are above and below the lateral line and typically they're supposed to be room for another par mark between two par marks whereas a king salmon which is more there's not many rearing kings around here I've yet to discover them even though I tried once it was not it was still a coho the kings will have fatter par marks so that you couldn't fit a par mark between par marks because these would be so much fatter so these are a coho so next Anyone want to take a guess? King seven. Not a king. King seven wouldn't have any par marks. So these are par marks. Most of them are above the lateral line. Although it doesn't quite look like it on that line. So they're regular. Picture I found. 
Um, but it is a, a stock guy, or it is a stock guy. It is a stock guy, but it's a stock guy, yeah. yeah. So go ahead to the next. And these you're not going to probably catch as many of, but you could. We found one in IVEC, which was a big surprise. So, um, and that was the one that we found in IVEC. All right, so those are the two main salmon that you could find in traps around here. Let's see some other fish that you might find. Anybody want to take a guess on what these are? Dollies. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. Yeah, and so one thing I want to point out about dollies is, actually go to the next slide that has the book, because they'll talk about light spots in the dark background, and like this is obvious light spots in the dark background. But in some of the juveniles, uh, the smaller sizes, it can be a little bit harder to see the light spots, but you can see that like instead of one par mark, there's actually two spots on top of each other. Um, and the other thing is that their heads are fatter than the salmon. They've got a big, their face is shaped different. So once you start they look more snake-like, kind of more slender their bodies versus... And they're slimy. <laughs> they're slimier than salmon. Um, but yeah, so those are Dolly Martin. Very nice. All right, what about this? Cutthroats, yep. Cutthroats are beautiful. Um, they've got spots on their dorsal fins. This was doesn't show up very well on the slide, but this was a picture taken in a bucket. Um, the big thing is that they don't necessarily, will have, it's not necessarily going to be red, but they'll have a yellow or a red mark on their throat. Um, I can go ahead and just the next one. Just give us the answer. But the biggest thing for these are the spots in the dorsal stand out at you, and they're just really pretty. Next. What about these? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think they might be the same family as dogfish, but it's open. Slimy and coastal. We don't worry about which is which. This is from, this is from your Fleming Creek survey last year. Um, those sculpin were found in Fleming Creek. Oh, yeah, yeah. I would, I would, I would. <laughs> Did you take that picture? <laughs> 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 they have um, sharp barbs on their insides for their gill plates. Um, yes. I don't know. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> you actually kill chicks, but. Can you what? Kill chicks, like um, birds that try to eat, like when chicks try to eat them when they're like yeah. caspian terns, so mm -hmm. their parents would try to feed them and those barbs would kill them. So I catch some version of that occasionally in my gill net. Okay. And they're really tricky to get out because of the Yeah. Okay. yeah. Next. And sculpin, they have a flat tail. You can see really nice in the top picture. So if you wanted to measure a sculpin, you would measure to the end of the flat tail. There's no fork, you measure to the end. Next. What's this one? I heard it. Yes, pickleback. Three spines, pickleback. These definitely have spines. And I like Maggie just went. <laughs> Bucket of fish, and you see some a fish that's like flapping crazy with its pectoral fins, and then it moves forward and backwards. Like that, that's just golden. <laughs> the, the rest of the fish and the trout and the char will move their body, their tail fins to move around, but our spigglebacks flap their pectorals rapidly, and they're closely related to the, the seahorse, which I think they kind of look like a seahorse, but they flatten out. <laughs> Um, and so I think what I did is I have included some pictures of upriver species just because it's fun to learn more about species that live in our watershed. So don't worry about being able to name these, but um, because it, it's hard because these are very similar to coho, but this one's a better example. Do you see its par marks, how close they are together? Does anyone remember what I said? It's a king. Yeah. Yes, excellent. It is a king. They are kings. Go ahead. So then here, the cartoon was very obvious that they're very big par marks so you couldn't fit another one. Unfortunately, fish don't follow these rules all the time. So in Cordova, the, the rule is that you're probably not going to find a king salmon. Um, but in some of the other tributaries, you want to have someone like Kirsty along who can deal with them. Like, I don't know. <laughs> it's tough. Go ahead, next. Maybe I want to take a guess at what this is. It's got a funny little face. Bottom feeder. Bottom feeder. What? How do bottom feeders feed? Upside down. Suckers. <laughs> this is how long those suckers. And there was one tributary that we studied with um, Glen Allen Middle School students that had hundreds of suckers in it. Oh, it was a, a 
interesting screen. So anyway, we won't see any of these here. But it's just fun. Anyone? This, so this one threw me because it looks it looked like a salmon to me when I first saw it. It's not. It's not. And it's not showing up very well in this picture. It has a very unique dorsal fin. And it's found up in the interior. So it's a grayling. A grayling. Yeah, these are already grayling. <laughs> <laughs> So this one looks very similar. You can't tell that it has spots in its dorsal, and it looks very familiar to our cutthroat, but it's missing something. It's missing the cut in its throat. So does anyone want to take a guess at what this one is? Stream width and stream depth. 
This is my favorite word from Salem Blitz is the thaw wag. And that's the deepest part of your stream um, of your, not, not in the pool, but if you're looking at like a run and it's the deepest part across the profile of that stream called the fall wag. And so that, we want to measure that deepest part of an average cross section. Again, you're not going to the deepest part of the whole stream, but looking at the run or where the, the, the river is not having deep pools or shallow ripples, the deepest part of that run is where you want to measure. And when measuring width, this shows that sometimes there might be vegetation. Um, because sometimes vegetation is supposed to be underwater. And so if that's the case, then you would measure to the full length of the full width of that stream where it would be if it wasn't low water. But if this grass is dry and well established, and it probably doesn't get covered with water, maybe this is, this is an old historic stream bank, or maybe this was from a flood a few years ago, whatever. Um, you would just measure where the water is. So again, don't stress about it, but in general, we just want to get an idea of how wide our stream is. And we do that um, at runs where there's a continuous stretch of the stream, because sometimes streams will braid out, they'll split in two and then meet back together again. And we don't, you know, we're not as worried about those stretches, those smaller stretches as we are interested in the main channel. And then we don't just take one measurement, we take three at three different places so that we can take an average of both the width and the depth. All right, next. Um, we also want to look at substrate. So this is the substrate size. Um, and again, you'll have, you'll be armed with cameras so that you can take lots of pictures. Um, and in general, we are interested in like the, the, the top three categories of, of sediment or of substrate. So the substrate is what's in the bottom of the stream. And so I try to explain, like, if we're looking, if we're going to do this 100%, say we have, let's break it down to 10 points. So we have 10 points to award to these different categories, and we'll give the most points to what there's the most of um, in, this, in the substrate, and the least points to what there's the least of, and then we can turn those points if we award 40 points to one, or four points to one thing and six points to another, then it would be like 40%, 60% type of breakdown. Um, it's a little confusing and it'll be easier to show you in practice and we have some examples here that you can look at um, so you can practice classifying the substrate. But anyway, what you want to do is go to where there's a ripple, so where the water is moving the fastest and look at what the substrate is. If you were to go to the, a deep pool, what do you think the substrate would tend to be like where it's moving slow and is deep? Um, or like slow. The opposite. Gravel. It's moving the slowest, so the finers can Sand. settle out. So it might even be sandy or silty. That's a good guess, though. Thanks for trying. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so you want to go to where it's moving fast, so you know that, it, that you still might find that there's sand in there, which is fine, and that that's one of the, the categories that you would give points to. Um, but you can, you know, just reach your hands in and look, grab a handful of it. In fact, go to the next slide here. Um, and here's all different examples of what different substrate looks like. And it's always helpful to put something, whether it's your hand or in that case it's a pencil, so we can get an idea for the size of the substrate. Um, and it also says on your data sheet that, you know, cobble is between 5 and 25 centimeters. So you can use your measuring board of your fit for the fish if you want to just see, am I seeing mostly cobble or is this gravel? Um, but again, and the other thing about this is does the substrate move easily and that just has to do with if a fish was going to be spawning here, could they move it with their tail to be able to um, build a nest or a red? Because sometimes there's a lot of fine sediments that get packed in and it can make it almost like a cement so that it's not movable at all. So that's why we asked consolidation, does it move easily, yes or no? Going on to the net. oh yes. Um, so are you looking at the substrate each time you put a trap down or are you kind of making a generalization over the whole stream? Great question, thank you. So this so I mentioned before when we were when we were talking about the fish that the fish is the most important, but on the first day what I would suggest is go and set your minnow trap so then you just walk the whole stretch of the stream and then on your way back you can pick out maybe three different areas along the stream um, that best represent that whole stretch that you walk, walk. So you can take your depth and width measurements at three different places, and then you would just do your substrate observations at one of those sites. So it's for the whole system, it's not for each trap, right? 
Thanks for clarifying that. Um, so then water quality and pictures. Um, so we have Amy's handheld pH tools, um, pH and temperature tools that make it pretty easy. Um, you put it, if it's a sunny day, make sure you're collecting the water temperature in the shade because the sun's going to influence the temperature of the water. Um, and you make sure you take the reading when it's in the water because as soon as you take it out of the water, it's reading the air. Um, and you just hold it in the water. I like to swirl it around like I'm stirring a cup of hot chocolate just to make sure the water is all around the probes on the bottom. And then on that little screen, the numbers will stop changing. And I have some here so you can play with them and see how they work. Um, so yeah, so that's for um, how we'll collect the temperature and pH data. And again, it's just that one spot on the screen. And then color, and you and your notebooks, there's more examples of the color categories, but clear, glacial, and muddy are a little bit more normal, or people are more familiar with those. Um, there's two other categories, ferric and humic. Ferric, we have actually a lot of around the Cordova area, but it's this irony, rusty color. Um, so some <laughs> systems will have, like, especially if anyone goes after the 17 mile stream, that one definitely has a lot, is a ferric system. And this is really hard to tell. Maybe it's better in your notebook. But the humic is like it's a tundra tea. It's ex it absorbed the tannins from the um, plants that it's flowing through. And so it gives it a brownish color. And it's not just brown because you stirred up the mud. It's brown because that's the color of the water. So you call that humic. Moving down to habitat elements. So we also like to just get a sense of what's making the habitat um, useful to fish. So um, the four things that I'm going to talk about next are all things that can influence what we call habitat complexity. And so instead of just a straight run um, with straight sides on the side, we have things like large weight debris, or LWD, um, standing for large weight debris. And so it creates really good habitat for fish, good shelter, good place to set them in a trap. So you want to, again, after you've walked that stretch, did you see a lot? Was it abundant? Was it moderate, sparse, or was there no largely debris in your stream? And we really, it's not so much the size of the, the woody debris that matters, but is it actually woody debris that's doing something to the stream? Like, is it, is it causing sediment to pile up in the top side of it and a really nice pool to form on the bottom. Like that's more important than large wood debris that fell over and has created a bridge across the stream because that's not doing anything for the fish. It's the woody debris that's falling into the stream. So next, um, large boulders. So this is a stream that has lots of large boulders and it acts the same as woody debris. It creates cascades and it also creates pools and other good places, fun pools to um, find fish. Um, undercut banks. Um, so this is what we mean by undercut banks. So um, you can't really tell in this picture, unfortunately, but like this track is like a foot and a half back underneath this stream bank. And I've been on streams around here where I've gotten above my knee by putting my leg underneath the undercut bank. And so that's awesome habitat for fish because it's shelter, it's shaded, it's cool, um, and they're not going to be obvious to predators. So that's a really good place to um, catch fish. And just something that we're interested in is there, are there undercut banks in this system? And then we're interested in uh, our vegetation. So the first one is overhanging vegetation. Like is, in some streams, you'll know, like, heck yeah, there's a lot of overhanging vegetation because you just bushwhacked and you know, scratched yourself 20 times and you know, had to go up and over and under because there's so much vegetation over the stream. Some, like out in the Cabo Delta, it's just grasslands on the side. There isn't that, those shrubs and trees and branches overhanging the stream. And why, why do you think that overhanging vegetation could be important for fish? This is um, so they're putting oxygen into the air, but they, what else might be hanging out in the vegetation? Um, food. Food? Like, what would fish food be? Bugs. Bugs sometimes fall off the branch into the water, yeah, so. And there's also, um, it, it's creating shade, so on those summer, summery, sunny Cordova days, it also helps keep those streams cooler. We're also interested in what type of vegetation it is. Um, so under our, um, on your data sheet under riparian vegetation, um, it asks for whether it's unvegetated, grassland or bog, 
chubby conifer deciduous or mixed conifer deciduous. Actually, there's not a mixed option. Just kidding. But you can select more than one option. So you can select deciduous and conifer. So what does it mean when I say a deciduous tree? Anyone? Thank you. I think they're the only one talking about me. Yeah, so leaves fall off versus a conifer would be what kind of trees do we have that are conifers around here? Spruce and hemlock. Yep. Close practice. Next slide. Why is, we get to the next slide, but why is there a specific about alders? Oh, we'll get there. Um, so just practicing really quick, how would you categorize the vegetation on this stream here besides cubicle? So there, there are some deciduous trees, yeah, so you could, I would check deciduous, what else might you check? What do you see here? Conifers. And then there's a lot of this low stuff, so shrubs. shrubs. So I might check three categories there. Yeah, and so next one. What about this one? Grassland. <laughs> Grassland and shrubby. Yeah, and it depends on where the stream goes. Maybe you could have some conifers nearby, but most of the vegetation right on the edge is your grasslands and your shrubs. Next. Um, it's kind of dark, but this is a good example of overhanging vegetation. And how would you just define that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all alders. There's actually some conifers, you can't see them. <laughs> this part of the picture. <laughs> yeah, you can see yeah, This is up river. Okay, next. What about this one? There's this is vegetation on the ground. So this would be another grassland. So, so you get the idea. Um, and then, Meadow asks, I think the next slide is, um, we're in particularly interested in alder. Does anyone want to take a guess why? Does anyone know what's special about alders? And if you use your resources, the answer might be in it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nitrogen fixer. So uh, alders are fixing nitrogen in the soil and can also benefit, so they're helping benefit the whole ecosystem by putting more nutrients there rather than just taking nutrients out of the system. So um, in those guides is actually a page from the Pacific, plants of Pacific Northwest to help you identify alders. But some of the key characteristics are these tooth leaves, small cones, and then these white nubs on the bark. Does the nitrogen relation to the stream, or is it just what? What's that? Does the nitrogen relation to the stream, or is it just that the whole system has more? Um, Christy, do you want to feel that one? <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, it's just the, their, the use of the nitrogen, and a lot of it is if it's a fish stream, usually you'll see alders. It's just the correlation between alders and fish presence, because fish carcasses is nitrogen. So then the alders can kind of uptake that nitrogen and redistribute it to other um, plants around. So there's just good, I and mean, it's just kind of a correlation between, like if you see alders on a stream, depending on some streams, but you know, it could be an indicative sign of fish being present as well. Okay. And then while we're out there, um, oh, these are other observations. So this is trying to, if you had, um, it asked about, um, back under habitat elements, it asked about side channels and stream side wetlands. And so this would be kind of stream side wetlands where you have a main channel, but there's these wetland pond areas that are still attached to it. So this would be an example of stream side wetlands. Side channel means like your main channel is going down, but there's a little, loop de loop or a channel on the side that's not part of the main channel. So just good to know if those are present or not. And then um, anything else while you're out there that might be notable, like maybe you see a culvert that's plugged with debris. Maybe you find lots of debris, like these fine Cordova High School students. Do I see Sam in there? I do. Um, who help collect a bunch of garbage on their outing. So every Sam Ming Blitz kit comes with a garbage bag in hopes that you'll leave the site better than when you find it. 
Um, if you find any crazy erosive activities, like a bank collapse or um, fish, there's spawning fish with an APG crossing, those kinds of details are helpful. Um, one of our groups, um, on one of our surveys, we found an old culvert that is no longer needed, but it's not helping the system at all, so we'll be able, we're going to be pursuing um, some means to remove the culvert so that it's not affecting the system because it's not needed. So it's just helpful to have eyes on the ground to help put those things out. So I think that covers the orientation of like what the data collection is, which I know is a lot. And I don't expect you to be an expert walking out of here tonight. Um, but how this has worked in the past few years is um, we'll spend the last however long you're interested in being here to check out the equipment and try out and you know, look at different substrates. Look, play with the minnow traps, play with the cameras, the GPS units, whatever you're interested in. Um, and then I have a sign-up sheet here. Um, I know you signed up, but that was, that was with Meadow, just to say that you came to the presentation. Um, I could, if everybody wants to do it, I can just take her data sheet. Or if um, this is where I was hoping to just get a little bit more information about, like, would you be interested in going out on a weekend or a weekday, or could you be available for both? Um, so this, this sign-up sheet would be helpful, and for um, the adults, if you haven't done a survey with me before but are interested in doing one, you can sign your life away saying that I'm not forcing you to do it, that you are volunteering to go into the wilds of Alaska and anything can happen and you're not going to hold us liable. We do have volunteer insurance, so that we're not going to leave you hanging, but just, you know, it's, if you're going to be in a fish stream, it could be slippery, it could be berry, it could be lots of fallen trees that you're hobbling over and under, so, you know, don't want to force anybody, but it's a lot of fun, and please do so at your own risk. <laughs> um, we do have, for volunteers that are interested, we'll um, outfit you. We've got um, 15 pairs of chest waders, thanks to the help from the Forest Service for purchasing them. Um, we'll give you a bag um, that is full of all the tools that you need. Um, if you have a notebook, it has a checklist, and you can see the list of equipment that you get. I also have samples of, I think, most of it up here. It includes a first aid kit. It includes snacks similar to what you were um, offered this evening, which you're still able to, be able to go get snacks if you'd like to. Um, we have um, all the tools that you need and extra things to support, like if you want to set extra flagging or you need to take extra notes. We have or if you have a hole in your waders or your batteries run out, we have all those things that we provide. So you'll have everything that you need, the minnow traps, a copy of the permit. And then we typically try for first time surveyors to have um, a guided trip. So somebody from the Forest Service or Kirsty or myself um, will be available to go out and help get you started on an outing or do an outing together. And then maybe um, after that, you feel like you want to go out and do it on your own. Um, so there's no pressure. I think last year maybe Maggie went out with Rich from Fish and Game once and then you and Shannon went out on your own the second time. So, um, so yeah, our hope is for you to have fun and be independent, but don't want you to be overwhelmed. So we'll certainly have experts on call to be able to, to work with you on your first survey um, or have a group survey where a larger group is together just to do some in-field training because it's hard to, to get it all down by standing here and sitting here in this room. Um, and so before we break up, I want to make sure that you meet um, some of our fine fishery biologists from the Forest Service here. Thanks, Andrew and Ken, for getting here. Um, early. Sorry that we're not ready right when you arrive. Um, but these guys have also been out in salmon blood surveys and um, are, are going to be able to help this fall. But this evening, um, I also have I really upgraded. I went from my fishy flashcards to a slideshow on my iPad now. So you can um, work with Kevin and Andrew to go through some more fish pictures and start getting used to the identification. Um, so if you want to practice your identification, you can do that with these guys. Um, and then maybe Kirsty, would you talk substrate again? Because you may use fine substrate bags so I still <laughs> call around with me. Um, so if you wanted to learn more about the substrate and see some examples, that's in here. Um, and if you want a snack, they're on the back table. Are there any questions before we get into any hands-on stuff? All right, everyone's ready to go out. <laughs> well,
cool. Well, um, let's go ahead and we'll turn on the lights and go ahead and grab a snack if you want. I'm, I, one thing I forgot to do um, it was I have, well, I have it. I just forgot to bring it. I was going to get a Coke and we can take a pH of Coke if people want to practice their pH meters. Mm -hmm. But do you guys have like two mugs or two cups that we could use? Yeah. So I'm going to get the Coke. You all can come check these things out and I'll get Andrew and you want to say you can, but you'll have a chance to use this in your family. <laughs> no, they're, they're, they get extra. Are you just kidding? Oh, they are. Are you asking Sam? Oh. They're in the process of the skins and they're in the process of the skins. Yeah, Greg, do you want to show people how to do the minute grabs? Oh, come on. 